everyone will have heard of pink puffers and blue bloaters. Um, I think they are very stereotypical um, pictures of COPD patients. They basically just describe a ratio of disease and the ratio being described is the extent of emphysema versus chronic bronchitis in these patients. Pink puffers tend to have emphysema as their primary uh, disease process in this uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and blue bloaters tend to have chronic bronchitis as their primary pathology. In the chronic bronchitics uh, you find that they're more cyanotic, more hypoxic and the pink puffers uh, just suffer from a lot more dyspnea and, and nasty airways, nasty lung fields with those um, obliterated alveoli. Um, it's not a particularly important characteristic, it's just important that you know that that is why they're called that. Um, and that's really about it. The other thing is important to realise is that if you see long-term oxygen therapy written anywhere on somebody's notes, be it COPD or for anything, it usually means their disease is severe. So that is a glaring, glaring um, input into their medical record that they are suffering from a severe form of the disease. Let's now discuss a couple of the elements that would contribute towards respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is really... Um, hard to characterize and the more advanced you get on if you do respiratory medicine or something like i do like intensive care medicine um this provokes a lot of debate it needn't provoke a lot of debate with you guys there are certain things you must just learn off you will learn off a stock definition for ARDS for ARDS you will learn a stock definition for respiratory distress and, and I do not want you to worry about all the nuances about what uh, what technically is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema just learn these things because um it will be of great help to you if you ever get asked about them in the exam. These are adult conditions. I'm not going to talk about neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. I'm going to talk about these in the adults. Respiratory distress is characterised by hypoxia, so a PO2 less than 8. Stiff lungs, non-compliant lungs, they don't expand and contract as they should. And widespread pulmonary infiltrates, that is edematous. You would approach this patient as you would approach any emergency with an ABC approach plus oxygen. You would look at their respiratory rate because you've already attached all the monitors, haven't you? And you're looking at the respiratory rate. If it's 20 plus, that's abnormal. If it's between 12 and 14, that's normal. You would do an ABG, a chest x-ray, and potentially a BNP, as well as all the other bloods um, on these patients um, because you're wanting to quantify any element of heart failure because of what we're going on to classify in acute respiratory distress syndrome. You should also be aware and beware of thromboembolism such as PE that masquerade as, as respiratory distress because they can cause uh, tachypnea as well especially if the chest x-ray is normal so if you have a normal chest x-ray with somebody who's in extremist respiratory distress you need to rule out a PE. They get respiratory failure, type 2 respiratory failure with an increasing CO2 and an acidosis. Now with ARDS you will see um, a couple of very characteristic things. You will see a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with hypoxemia and the whole the whole thing behind ARDS is that it is a increase in alveolar capillary permeability that causes leaky membranes that allows fluid to pour out of it and it is defined as non-cardiogenic um, in nature because it's not the heart and the failure of the heart as a pump that causes this stasis and stagnation of blood it is the endothelial dysfunction of the capillary bed of the lungs this causes hypoxemia as pulmonary edema would and it is caused by Four main things that you should probably remember. Sepsis is the main cause, particularly things like pseudomonas. Two, trauma. So even burns and things like that can cause an ARDS. Um, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy um, or overdose of drugs. And any severe disease, any liver disease, renal disease, any severe disease that would put you in ICU, for example, uh, will cause ARDS. ARDS will normally appear within 24 hours, but certainly will uh, appear within five days. Um, the main step of treatment is treating the primary disorder of what's causing it, and identifying that can be difficult. The patient will um, present or be short of breath. They will have ronchi or crackles in keeping with the edematous process in the lungs. They will be hypoxic and hypercapnic, and they will have whiteout on their chest x-ray. Usually a bad ARDS is an indication for mechanical ventilation if they're not already on it. Next in this whirlwind tour of respiratory medicine, we're going to look at bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is an obstructive disease. It is characterised by permanent dilation of the bronchi. 
normally small and medium bronchi are affected and it can have a local or diffuse effect depending on the causative pathology that's causing the bronchiectasis. So it can be local in one area of the lungs or it can be throughout the lungs depending on what is wrong with you. The patient will have a very productive cough, they'll have a very productive of mucus, they'll have hypermuco, hypermuco um, secretions. They will also unfortunately have a decreased cough. Uh, their ciliary don't work very well. Their cilia don't work very well. They will have uh, a low levels of immunoglobulin and low levels of celiac in total. Uh, it's a, it's an obliterative disease, bronchiectasis. Causes of bronchiectasis uh, are Cartagener syndrome, cystic fibrosis, childhood diseases in general of the chest um, or anatomy. Burns patients can get bronchiectasis. Gram negative uh, pneumonias predominant the disease like Pseudomonas. They can characterize um, bronchiectasis and um, superimposed infections on top of bronchiectasis. You need to watch out for those infections. You need to watch out for hemoptysis and recurrent infections and try to get on top of them um, as quickly as possible. Because of that decreased cough, they can't clear the pathogens. Because because of the decreased cilia, they can't clear the pathogens, so just be aware of that. We treat bronchiectasis um, with antibiotics and you investigate it with a chest x-ray and you get a high resolution CT scan of the chest to characterise the damage done uh, to all those mid-sized and, and smaller airways. Uh, you definitely need to have uh, an antibiotic that will cover Pseudomonas uh, in terms of um, your infection and then you can narrow down your antibiotic choice once you have isolated a pathogen in an acute um, inf infective episode with somebody with bronchiectasis. In the chronic condition um, you can use bronchodilators such as salbutamol, ipitropium bromide, get them good chest physio, teach them how to clear their chest, use a cough assist etc. Uh, you should rotate your antibiotics to prevent resistance um, in these patients that's extremely important. You should vaccinate all these patients yearly for flu and um, pneumonias, for example, if you can do that. Uh, they, sh they, they can also have surgery for, surgery for local disease if the disease is confined to a specific part of their airways. Um, surgery can be indicated. Farmer's lung or extrinsic allergic alveolitis is a hypersensitivity pneumonitis that is induced by the inhalation of biological dusts that comes from hay or mould spores or any other agricultural product really. Uh, it results in a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, usually about 6 to 9 hours post exposure to that allergen. Uh, one of the main uh, culprits, one of the main microbes that's associated with it is um, Saccharopolyspora rectivergula. Um, the disease can cause respiratory distress, as we just discussed um, earlier on in the lecture. It can cause fever and it can cause basal crackles. Uh, you usually get spontaneous recovery in 24 hours. Now, normally hypersensitivity reactions in the chest are caused by IgE. Um, Saccharopolyspora does not cause IgE. It causes an IgG complex to form, which then deposits immune complexes within the lung wall. This then causes the um, pathognomonic non-caseating or non-caseating granulomas, because uh, they are the immune complexes that are deposited in the wall. Now, I'll talk about a couple of things that you should probably remember for the exams. I'm not going to go into interstitial lung disease in too much detail. There is an association with an increase in anti-DNA anti um, to poismarase levels. There's an association with um, asbestosis, which would normally occur in the lower lung fields, give lower lung field shadows. If you've got a progressive massive fibrosis, this affects lung parenchyma. It's associated with emphysema, and there are radio opacities of greater than 10 millimeters present in your lung fields on a chest X-ray or CT scan. This will tend to affect the upper lobes first, these uh, radio opacities in this massive um, progressive fibrosis, whereas asbestosis normally affects the lower lung fields, so that's just one of your differentials. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is quite a nasty disease. It has about an 80% chance of mortality within five years from diagnosis. It is characterised by chronic lung inflammation. Its etiology is unknown, but it only affects the lungs. It doesn't affect any other uh, organ system. The pulmonary function test shown would be restrictive in nature, as, as, as in keeping with a fibrotic lung disease. And you will see diffuse reticulonodule patterning on CT scan. You can do a bronchoscope and lavage. Um, it will be non-specific, but it will exclude um, the disease. It will, it, it will exclude a fibrotic picture. And about 20% 
of the people uh, only respond to steroids so you need to uh, try to get them on steroids and see if it's responsive uh, to steroids it is associated uh, with increased polyclonal antibody levels uh, in the body just in case that ever comes up as a mcq question etc it is more common in smokers and to investigate it properly uh, using a scanning technique you would need to request a high resolution ct scan of the chest just to characterize the um the smaller elements of fibrosis in the chest so the causes of pulmonary fibrosis are many but happily they can be divided into upper zone causes and lower zone causes uh, obviously with respect to the lung anatomy so causes of um, pulmonary fibrosis in the upper lobes should be remembered by the acronym or the mnemonic breast and um, b for um, paraleosis r for radiation e for a extrinsic allergic alveolitis uh, a for ankylosing spondylitis, S for sarcoid disease, and T for TB. So that's a good way of remembering uh, just a handful of causes of um, upper zone fibrosis. Unfortunately, there's not really a mnemonic for lower zone causes of, um, of fibrosis. However, they include cardiothoracic disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, amiodarone, bleomycin, uh, which is a um, anti-cancer drug, nitrofurantoin, uh, silicosis and asbestosis. Uh, these probably are, are best remembered because if the examiner asks you, name a couple of causes of pulmonary fibrosis, it sounds very impressive if you have a systematic way to remember it. So exams can often ask you how to spot a pulmonary embolism. They love using the S1, Q3, T3 pattern on an ECG that is so rarely seen but so commonly asked. You would see the deep S wave in lead 1, the Q wave and inverted T wave in, in lead 3. You'd see a right axis deviation, a right bundle branch block with a sinus tachycardia. The patient would be unwell, tachycardic, short of breath, clammy with a pain in their chest. Uh, and they would have a positive D-dimer. You need to make sure they don't have atrial flutter, uh, small complexes that can be indicative of um, pulmonary embolism, ST or T wave changes, right axis deviation just in general, and right ventricular strain because uh, the heart's not able to pass around the lung, the heart is not able to pass blood around the lung properly. Superior vena cava syndrome or compression syndrome. Um, comes up uh, quite a lot in finals exams really and the first thing you should be thinking of is I wonder would I be able to say a Horner syndrome in this patient from that posterior chain uh, involvement. The patient would present with headache, blurred vision, distended neck veins. They would have darker skin in their face versus their body. They can be confused because of the change in blood flow and blood supply to the head because of the blockage uh, in the superior vena cava. It's actually causing an, an enlargement of the veins and the back pressure in, into the head that can increase um, ICP. Um, chest x-ray might show an upper lobe, upper lobe lesion or mass investigations you'd look for cancer markers you do a ct scan you do blood tests and definitive treatment would be removal of the of the mass um or stenting of the svc if possible or palliation it all depends on what's causing the svc syndrome you'd see a respiratory alkalosis in these patients due to an increased respiratory rate they're trying to blow off their co2 because hypercapnia causes an increased intracranial pressure so they're they're trying to reduce their intracranial pressure because it's already got backflow because if you imagine superior vena cava um has offshoots and feeds from the brain and into the internal and external um, jugular veins all the way down into the superior vena cava so you get back pressure and increase of uh, intracranial pressure <laughs> 